Well, good evening, saints. It's good to see you this evening on a Wednesday evening, and we're glad to be here together to study the Word of God. We welcome you here in the auditorium, and then uh, those of you who have joined us online, we're always glad to know you're there. And uh, we pray that the Lord will just uh, open the Word to us tonight and open our hearts to the Word so that we leave better than when we came. And uh, this is just a good opportunity to feast on the Word of God. So uh, as we begin, I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, you, you probably already know that uh, Tony Millsout had an incident this morning and uh, fell at school, blood pressure dropped, and uh, required three stitches in her head, she transported to St. Mary's Hospital, and uh, uh, she's there now. Everything looks okay. Uh, they're going to keep her overnight for observation and make sure they get her blood pressure back up to where it needs to be. Uh, don't exactly know what caused this, but uh, hopefully it's just a one-time event, and uh, she's, uh, she's doing okay. So we praise the Lord for that, and we'll continue to pray for her. So let's bow together. Heavenly Father, it is such a joy for us to come together on a Wednesday evening. It, it sort of picks things up in the midst of the week when we can come together to uh, be fed at your table. And we pray that you would bless the food that we received tonight to the nourishment of our spiritual bodies. I pray that it will serve to, to build us up more in the faith once delivered to the saints. We thank you for every person that's here and what they mean to this church and for the hunger they have for your word. And uh, we lift up uh, Tony and ask you to just be with her through the evening, give her your peace, and we pray that she's improving moment by moment, and this time tomorrow certainly she'll be back at home and uh, be back very quickly to her normal strength and health. Thank you that uh, she was not hurt worse than she did, only about three stitches in her head, so we can rejoice in that and give you all the praise and thank you. And uh, in just a few moments, we'll be spending some time in prayer over others who need our prayers. So we ask, Lord, that you would grant us an anointing of your Holy Spirit because we're gathered here in your name and in your presence and for your glory. And we give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to begin a new uh, study in the book of Hebrews. So I invite you to take your Bible and turn with us to Hebrews. And uh, as I've said before, Hebrews seems, for whatever reason, seems to be one of those uh, almost neglected books. At least it gets probably least uh, or less attention than many of the other New Testament books. But it is a fabulous, fabulous uh, writing. And uh, we're going to attribute it to Paul. Now I know there's, uh, you've always heard that there's some discussion and disagreement over exactly who penned the letter because the name of the author does not appear here. But it has all the markings of the Apostle Paul. So we're just going to leave it at that. And uh, as, we, as we move forward, I want you to understand that this book, which I hold in my hand, which we call the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, is all about Jesus. Now, I, I, I say that because Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. But I want to stress the, the, the fact as we move through this book that Jesus is Messiah. And I like to use his personal name. Uh, Messiah is his title. I like to use his personal name. So we are connecting with exactly who Jesus is. And tonight, we're just going to enjoy relishing in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can never spend enough time just uh, contemplating who Jesus is. And uh, this is the way the book of Hebrews begins. The book, the Bible, is uh, a unique book of all the books that have ever been put together. It's still the number one seller in all of the world, and it, it has been every year for, uh, for past generations. Uh, and it's interesting that in the Old Testament, Jesus is concealed, and in the New Testament, he is revealed. So these are companion books. And we can never separate ourselves from the Old Testament. Most people rather enjoy the New Testament and focus on the New Testament. And we don't hear a lot of sermons from the Old Testament. But the Old Testament is critical to the New Testament. There's the concealing and the revealing of those two to go together. Uh, one of the passages of Scripture that 
we'll begin looking at is in Psalm chapter 2. The two verses there, verses 11 and 12. And you might want to take just a moment and turn there. We're going to look at quite a few passages, and some of those we'll not take time to turn to. But the psalmist says in chapter 2, verse 11, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The only way you can understand this passage of Scripture is to see it as Jesus. The whole concept, now remember this is a concealing, but it is a tremendous clue here because the name of Jesus does not appear. But where would you suppose that this phrase, kiss the sun, where do you suppose that would come from? Well, you find it clearly when you come to the New Testament. Uh, another passage is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It's a passage you'll be familiar with, uh, with uh, because of Christmas. It's one of those go-to passages that we hear every Christmas. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin. It doesn't say a virgin, does it? It says the virgin. The articles are very important. It's a particular virgin, not just any virgin, but the virgin. We know that to be Mary. The virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we all know that uh, the name Emmanuel means what? God with us. So here's the virgin. Here's the son that is conceived by the virgin. And his name is Emmanuel. You call his name Emmanuel. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. You remember that uh, the three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace and as Nebuchadnezzar looked on that scene, we hear him say, I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Where did that thought come from? Certainly the Holy Spirit plants this there as a concealing of Jesus Christ. Then we look at... Uh, uh, Isaiah or Micah in uh, chapter 5 verses 2 and 3 and I will ask you to take time and turn there you might have a problem finding the book of Micah but listen to these words you O Bethlehem from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, to whom other than Christ would you contribute these thoughts? Uh, we find him coming forth from of old, from the ancient of days. In verse 3, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. This can only be understood as Jesus Christ. And this is the kind of thing that Jesus began his ministry with. When he was back in his hometown, Nazareth, at the very beginning of his ministry, you find this in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. You might want to take a moment and turn there because we're looking at uh, several verses here. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me 
to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and a recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor would be a reference, of course, to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And then verse 20. And he rolled up the scroll when he had finished reading, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus began his ministry with an Old Testament passage declaring that he was the fulfillment of that passage. Philip literally did the same. And you remember Philip's encounter in Samaria with, uh, uh, you remember when he attached himself to the, to the uh, chariot of the eunuch. And uh, they had a discussion. Philip asked him what he was reading. And he said he was reading from Isaiah 53. And Philip did the same as Jesus did with that Ethiopian eunuch. He began at an Old Testament passage and revealed Jesus Christ. Paul's practice was literally the same to the churches in which he ministered. In Acts chapter 20, verse 27, as he met with the Ephesian elders on his way back to Jerusalem, we find this statement. He said, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That would be a reference to the Word of God, the whole counsel, everything God has revealed to us, Old Testament and New. And to preach the whole counsel of God is nothing uh, more than just preaching all of the Word of God, and it's preaching Jesus, preaching Jesus in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is God's Word to the world. Jesus is God's final Word to the world. So the title of the study tonight is How God Speaks. Now, we read in verse 2 of, uh, uh, of Hebrews chapter 1, in verse 2. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. God spoke, first of all, through the prophets in the Old Testament. But now he speaks to us by his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's own son. He is the third person of the Trinity. Once again, the only way to understand these passages, Old Testament and New Testament, is to understand the Trinity. Now, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of so-called denominations that do not believe in the Trinity. But if you don't believe in the Trinity, you don't understand the Trinity, it's literally impossible to decipher these verses and to get any understanding from them. It is necessary that there be the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three are equal, and all three compose the one true God. Frequently in the Scripture, we find God referred to as the Father. But frequently, as you'll see, we find Jesus Christ referred to as God. We dealt with this in Revelation chapter 21. And it was very clear there that Jesus Christ is God. And that goes back to uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. He is God with us. So he is God's only son, the third person of the Trinity, and that's a part of the Nicene Creed. Uh, Baptists have said in the past that we're not a creedal people, but we, we actually do have a creed. Our creed is what we believe, and the Nicene Creed is one of those that we uh, follow, one of those that we subscribe to as Baptists. And in that Nicene Creed, we find these words, God of God, speaking of Jesus Christ, he is God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Now, I know that's strange language, but it's just a, a way of, of nailing this down precisely who Jesus Christ is. But Jesus is more 
than the Son of God. He is more than the prophet. He is more than a teacher. He's more than a healer. He's more than uh, a miracle worker. He's more than a great orator. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And we, we rejoice in that. And this is our faith. This is what we as Christians believe. He is also the heir. He's the heir of the world. Once again in verse 2. Whom the Lord, whom God, has appointed the heir of all things. And notice the article, the. Jesus is the heir of all things. Also through him who created the world. This is our Father's world. And we rest in that thought. But this is our Father's world, and he has taken that world, and he has appointed his Son as heir of this world. He has given this world to his Son. He has bequeathed it as the owner of everything, as a father in our day does to his own children. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, we find a confirmation of this when he says, We do not see, yet see all things put under him. All things have been put under his feet, but we don't see that yet. Why? Because he is not ruling and reigning yet. He is seated at the Father's right hand. Satan is the ruler of this present world. But listen to John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. King, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. So Jesus is the heir of the world. It belongs to him. Now he is pleased to do with us what the Father has done with him. The Father bequeathed this earth to his Son, and the Son in turn brings us into the picture and shares that inheritance with us. So he actually owns everything, but he's delegated parts of this kingdom unto his saints, unto those who have trusted him. Now, Jesus Christ has authority to do this, given to him by the Father. And it's interesting to understand, and I hope you by now have a good understanding of this, that Jesus Christ is also the creator of all things. Now, God, the Father, has designed everything and delegated to his son the role of being the creator. Uh, once again, in verse 2, through whom also he created the world. He there would be God the Father. And it's clear here that he has created the world through Jesus Christ. Christ is actually the creator of everything that exists. And this is comforting to us. Man doesn't really create anything. We talk about man creating things, but man has not created one single uh, a gnat or fly. He has not created one single particle of dust. Man does not create. Man simply uses what God has created to develop certain things. Uh, if we need a new world, then God is through Christ, going to give us a new world. We found that in Revelation 21, verse 5. He who was seated on the throne, this is our Lord Jesus Christ, said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus Christ is the only creator. He is the only one that can create something out of nothing. And that's how he created the world. So it's obvious that we need a new world. And that's the reason we have this uh, green movement now. And all of these that are trying to control climate change so that we can preserve the earth. Why? Because it is corrupt. Because the world around us is deteriorating. It is coming apart. And so we know, all of us know, that we need a new world. And Jesus Christ is the one who is going to give us a new world. What a wonderful thought. And if we need a new body, it's Jesus Christ who will give us a brand new body. You find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. You also find it 
in uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter, last part of chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5. Those are passages that you're all familiar with. But listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable body, and this mortal body must put on immortality. It's very clear that the moment we die, we get a brand new body. Now, isn't that a beautiful thought? Uh, I found that through the years, many people think that the believers are not going to get a new body until Jesus Christ returns. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that at the point of death, physical death, you and I receive a brand new body. We move from this old body into a brand new body. And it is a body that is not susceptible to disease. This body is going to die. All of us know that. The older you get, the more you're, you're reminded that this body is not going to last you very long. And uh, the older you get, you begin to sense that it's just wearing down. And one of these days, we're going to be very feeble. We live long enough, like Peter, We'll probably have to have somebody to lead us around and somebody to carry us around. But uh, we know that we just know that this body is not going to last forever, regardless of what we do. It's comforting to know that the moment we die, we have a brand new body. Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, we do not want to be without a body. I don't know about you. I don't want to be without a body. I don't know what it would be like to be without a body. And so I'm looking forward to a brand new body. I won't have any weight problems then because my body will be perfect. Uh, uh, the problems that you and I deal with on a daily basis will all go away because everything about this body is going to be perfect. We'll still eat and we'll still drink just like Jesus did at the last breakfast. That was the last meal he had with his disciples, of course. It wasn't the last supper. The last meal he had with them was the last breakfast. And he ate fish and he drank with them. You don't eat without drinking. And so uh, Jesus was showing us that, that it will be a body just like this and we'll carry on. They all recognized him. It was a body just like theirs with one exception. Their body was still perishable. His body was imperishable. So the Lord is the only one that can give us a brand new body. And we're going to need that brand new body. And uh, uh, we also are going, to, uh, are, are going to see that brand new world. We covered that. Uh, now, Jesus Christ is the image of God's glory. If you look at uh, verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God. In other words, radiance. We know something about the radiance of the sun. It radiates. And, uh, 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 and getting too close to the sun can do some damage to us. But remember that the closer we get to the sun spiritually, the better we are. So the illustrations are not really the same. But he is the radi radiance of the <coughs> glory of God. The glory of God radiates from him. The word glory there is the word in which we get Shekinah glory. It means the true essence of a being. And that's what Jesus Christ is. And he is the exact imprint of God's nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he's the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact image of the Father. In other words, I think some of the translations say he is the exact, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not... Uh, he is the exact representation of God the Father so that he can say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And he is the indispensable power. Notice that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, this is awesome power, and we can't really comprehend this. We, we know that there must be some force that's keeping the universe together, that's keeping all of the planets in their particular orbit, which is... Uh, uh, something that must be controlling 
the, uh, the turning of the earth with precision. We can go to the moon and we can go to Mars based on, on, on our calculations of time because it just does not change and it never has changed. But it stands to reason with those of us who are thinkers that there must be some force that keeps everything moving in its proper sphere at its proper rate, turning at its proper rate. There's got to be something that controls gravity, that pulls everything together. And the answer is that it is the awesome power of Jesus Christ. He is the power, the indispensable power. Without Christ, the entire universe would be spinning out of control. But everything is precisely in control. And that's because of the indispensable power of Jesus Christ. And then fourthly, uh, the scripture says that he made purification for sin. And he is the only one that could do that because he is the perfect lamb. He epitomizes every lamb that was slain from the foundation of the, of the world. With one exception, with one distinction, he is the only perfect lamb that was ever slain. Now there was slain in the Old Testament what was considered to be the best lamb that a person could find for the Passover. You needed to find the very best lamb you could find without any spot or without any wrinkle. But the fact remains that it was not a perfect lamb. Jesus Christ is the only perfect lamb. And he purified our sins. I'm not going to take time to talk about this tonight, but I just want to give you something to think about. There are two aspects of our relationship with the triune God. And one is how God sees us. God sees us as he sees Jesus Christ. Because of this glory, he, he radiates the glory of God. And because of that, and because we have been placed in Christ, when God looks at us, all he sees is the glory of Jesus Christ, which is his own glory. It's like the sun that, that, that blinds everything else. If you and I go out on a day like today at 1 o'clock and look up at the sun and you look at it for just a moment, you look away, you don't see anything else but that blinding sun. And that's the best concept we have of how God sees us. You will never, ever in all of eternity be more right with God the Father than you are today because all of the work of Jesus Christ has been attributed to you. It has been it, it has been placed into you, all of it. So you will never be better than you are before God. But that's how God sees us. And God knows that we're not yet perfected. So God can only look on us as he sees Jesus. He has given us to Jesus Christ to purify. That's our Lord's mission. It is to purify us and to make us like himself. And that's what we're doing here tonight. That's what studying the scripture is all about. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to reproduce the Christ life in us. Now, Jesus, because he is the son of God and because he is the son of man, he can look on sin. He can handle sin because he took our sin to the cross. And Jesus sees us differently than God the Father sees us. Jesus sees us as we really are. He sees us with every flaw, with every weakness, with every, every habit, with every, every shortcoming we have. He sees us with every spiritually with every wart and every wrinkle and every bulge. He sees us as we really are. And that's the significance of the uh, bridegroom, is it not? Now we know that Jesus Christ is not actually our bridegroom and we're not actually his bride, but it's a metaphor. It's a picture of something we're very familiar with. And we know at best when, when, when life is being lived the way God intended it, the first one to see a woman in her nakedness as she really is, is the privilege of the bridegroom. The groom gets to see her as she really is. After the wedding dress is taken away, after all of the, the, the makeup and everything is taken away, the privilege of the groom is to see the bride as she really is. This is our relationship before Jesus Christ. He, representing the groom, gets to see us as we really are. Now this is both comforting and disturbing. And people get the two confused. But you can never confuse the two. 
Uh, God sees us as he sees Christ in all of his righteousness. And Jesus sees us as we really are. That's why he knows how to test us, how to put us to trial. He knows where our weaknesses are, and he is refining us, and he is taking away. He's purifying us as gold is purified by the testing, by the fire. So I hope that will help you some as we look at these passages. It's important to make a distinction when we're uh, looking at our relationship with God that we may be talking about our relationship with God the Father, or we may be talking about our relationship with Jesus Christ, who himself is God. So, Jesus Christ, we're told here, Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. Now, this is important. Uh, look again at verse, uh, the last part of verse 4. After making purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, read on. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he inherited. Now, what name did he inherit? The name that he inherited is the Son of God, Emmanuel. So he is much more superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs, the angels. Verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Now you understand that the name son is the name he inherited. For to which of the angels did God ever say, God the Father, did he ever say, you are my son? You can only be speaking of Jesus. Today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. But he's not through. Now you wonder why he's making such a strong case for this. Verse 6, And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But he says to the angels that uh, they are to worship Jesus Christ. Now Paul gives us a warning in Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason, and by his sensuous mind. So Paul's warning is that we do not worship angels, that we don't let anybody lead us astray that we are not to go on in details about visions. Think about how many ministries today are based on a vision that someone had, and they can give you astounding details of that vision. And Paul warns us against that. Paul says, don't let somebody disqualify you. Now, what does he mean by disqualify? Does he mean if you fall prey to that, you'll be unsaved and lost again? No. It's literally impossible for one who is born again to be unborn again. Could you, can, can you imagine any way that a person who is born a human being could become unborn as a human being? Well, why do we have that analogy in John chapter 3? What's the significance of that? It's to tell us that once we're born into God's family, we will always be in God's family. There is not one with of evidence in Holy Scripture that will tell you you can be saved and lost again. And it doesn't matter who tells you that something's there. They can't show it to you. It's just not there. If you are born again, you are a new creation. And a lot of people will say, well, that just means that if you're born again, you're going you're to show a real difference in your life. No, no, no. That's not what that means. Now, you might want to make an application for that, and you can stretch it and probably do so. But but that verse actually means that you are 
not you will be, or not you ought to be, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Now, what does that mean? It means that you've been born again. You're a brand new person. And what kind of person are you? You're a person with the nature of Christ. When you were born the first time, you had only the nature of Adam. If you didn't have that and still have it, you'd never have a problem with sin. You just, you just never would sin. We sin because we still have Adam's nature. And that's the only way we can sin. But remember this, that Jesus Christ is the express image of God's nature. And when you have Christ in you, you have the exact image of God's nature dwelling in you. And this is the new birth. And it means that you have the nature of God dwelling in you. And that, of course, is through the Holy Spirit. If any man does not have the Spirit of God, he doesn't belong to it. So if you're born again, you have the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You don't have to go looking for the Spirit. You don't have to ask God to give you the Spirit. If you're born again, you have the Spirit. It is the nature of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you've got that. I hope you've got it clear because it's critically important that you understand that. You can never be lost. You can never lose faith. Now, you may step away from your faith. We're going to look at that a little later on, early on, in our study of Hebrews. It's possible for you to step away from the faith. That's what a backslider does. He hasn't lost faith. He knows what his faith is. He knows where his faith is. But he steps away from it. He does the unthinkable. He tries to live as if he had no faith. But that faith is always there. It's God's gift to us. And God does not retract a gift. The gifts and the callings of God are without recompense. So you have the Spirit of God indwelling you. You are a new creation because you have two natures. The nature of Adam and the nature of Christ. And I know I say this over and over again, but I find that the most effective way of learning is repetition. So we need to hear it again and again so it becomes second thought to us. It, it just becomes natural to us. But this is the Word of God, and this is who we are. Now, when he says, don't let anybody deceive you, and, and by being deceived, you become disqualified, what is he talking about? Disqualified from what? Well, it's disqualified from receiving your full inheritance to be disqualified from reigning with Jesus Christ. Because if we endure, we shall reign with him. And there's that little word, if. It's contingent upon us remaining faithful. And through the study, we're going to be looking at a number of scriptures that will make that very clear to you. We don't want to be disqualified from receiving what God has promised. That's the purpose we saw in James chapter 1 of our testing and our trials. It, uh, we have to endure those. We have to pass those tests. We don't want to fail. And we don't want to lose sight of who we are and step away from the faith and become a backslider. We want to be sure that we maintain our position and we actually are living like who we are. So he says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Now there's that Adam, the mind of Adam. The mind of Adam is a sensuous mind. And that's what causes you to, to fulfill the passions of the flesh. And this is what Peter's talking about, what we're looking at on, in our Sunday series. Peter is talking about Denying the passions as obedient children. Don't walk according to your, the passions of your former ignorance, but be holy. Don't satisfy the passions of your flesh. But we've gotten so used to it, we satisfy the passions of our flesh without even realizing it. We don't even know. We don't even realize when we do. So we need to be praying that God, through his Holy Spirit, would convict us every time we indulge in a passion of the flesh. Because it's never pleasing to God. It's never honoring to Him. John also gives us a warning. And this is the Apostle John. And I'll point you to Revelation 22, verses 8 and 9. We have looked at these verses. We didn't spend much time on them as we finished in chapter 22. But listen to what John says. He gives us a warning. He says, When I heard and saw these things, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel 
who showed them to me. Verse 9. But the angel said to me, you must not do that. Don't fall down and worship me. The words of the angel. He said, I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of the book, of this book. Worship God. That was the word that was given to John by the angel. Don't worship me. Worship God. I'm only an angel. I'm a fellow worker with you. And that's what angels are. They, they are fellow workers with us. They come along beside us. I won't press this too far, but it does appear from the study of Psalms that each one of us has an angel assigned to us. And maybe that angel has multiple numbers of us, three or four or five, maybe more. But there's an angel that is watching over us, and guiding us, and helping us in addition to the Holy Spirit. And so we're not to worship angels. I'm just thinking through the years how many homes I've been in where uh, I've known women, Christian women, who had an entire wall displayed with angels. And they were just so, in, uh, so, so uh, involved in, in angels. I wouldn't say they were worshiping angels, but certainly they were occupying themselves with angels. And they tell you about this angel and this one and where this one came from and this one. And one stands out in my memory. And uh, John and Paul would say, no, no, don't give too much attention to angels. We have the same problem with the Holy Spirit. When you hear somebody talking about the Spirit of God and receiving the Spirit and, and going on and on about the Spirit of God, you need to be careful in listening to them. Because the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus Christ and God the Father. The Holy Spirit does not come to glorify himself. The Holy Spirit's not pleased when we glorify him and we focus our attention on him and we uh, occupy ourselves with him. He's pleased when we occupy ourselves with Jesus Christ. He is the one who will direct us to do that. And he's the one that brings the word of God to our minds. He is there to point us to Jesus, and in pointing us to Jesus, to point us to the Father. So, these are, these are powerful warnings. Now, uh, I don't know how much farther we'll get. We're probably going to wind this down. But I want to call your attention to verse 8. We're in, still in chapter 1. With these words, only one way. There is only one way to worship God. Only one. Hebrews 1.8. It's in contrast to what he has just told us about the angels. He says, uh, well, let's, let's just go back to the previous verse. Uh, and he said what we were looking at. He says, worship him. Don't worship me. Don't worship the angels. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Verse 9. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Look at this phrase. Therefore, God, your God. Who is the first God? That's God the Father. He says, therefore, God, your God. Now, who is your there? Your God. That's Jesus. The only way to understand this is that Jesus and God the Father are one. And that takes us back to the nature of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit compose one God. The Mormons do not like this teaching. They... Uh, the Mormons cannot understand this because they do not understand the Word of God uh, at all. They are very confused. Uh, and you need to uh, avoid them, I would say, if they come to your door. You should engage them in a conversation, but make sure the conversation is about Jesus Christ 
And one of the questions that you'll have for them, along with Jehovah's Witnesses, if they come to your door, is who is Jesus? And you need to press the fact that Jesus is God. He not, he's, he, the Mormons would say, oh, but Jesus is going to be God. He said, no, no, no. Jesus is God. And this is one of your proof texts right here. You need to understand this. A uh, clear teaching of the Word of God is that God the Father is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is God. And God the Father has anointed Jesus Christ with the oil of gladness beyond his companions. So he stands paramount. He has a seat that's higher than the angels. None of the angels have ever occupied a seat at the right hand of God the Father. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the scripture is very clear. And this will never change. And it's a great comfort to us. And it's a delight to contemplate the very nature of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find this over and over as we move on into the next verse. We'll be going into verse 10 next week and finishing uh, the chapter. I hope you'll be here and invite some other people to be with you because uh, these are the kind of things that are going to be revealed to us in the Word of God. And we want to make sure that we rightly divide the Word of God that we do not add to it, that we not take away from it, and that we seek to understand it uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, not through our own contemplation, not through our own meditations. None of us is capable of understanding the Word of God on our own. But Jesus promised us that the Holy Spirit would come and he would guide us into all truth. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would pour your Spirit out on us we pray that you would help us to approach your word in a way that brings honor and glory unto you. We pray that we'll not do it on a denominational basis, that we don't come to your word as Baptists. We don't come to your word as Methodists or as, uh, uh, as Presbyterians or as Pentecostals or as Catholics or as Mormons or Jehovah's Witness. Uh, we see the error that can be made when we come to the scriptures with the mind of man. What we want is to see the scriptures in light of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we have the mind of Christ and we can understand your word. We can develop a real comprehension of your word and we can come to the place where we can give a reason for the hope that is within us. We thank you, Father, for your presence. And we thank you for, our presence on a, for your presence on a daily basis. I thank you that uh, many in this congregation have taken up the task of reading and meditating in your word every single day. Uh, we were amazed at how many uh, picked up the, uh, the reading guide that will take us through the uh, Bible once and through the Psalms of the New Testament twice in a single year. And what a joy it is to embark on that. And we pray that you uh, make the, this congregation a congregation of the word, people who are meditating in your word uh, day and night, just like the psalmist in Psalm 1. And now, Father, we lift up our, our churches to you, uh, the church, the universal church. We have uh, so many who are born again in multiple denominations. Not everybody in these denominations is, is lost. There are many who have looked to Christ and trusted in Christ and are not looking to a denomination or any other human being, but they're looking to your word. And we pray for a great revival in your, among your people. Uh, Linda was just reading this afternoon in the book of Amos that you would send a famine in this country a famine among your people. And the famine was not a famine of preachers. Uh, you don't tell us there'll be a famine of preachers. But you do tell us through the prophet Amos that there'll be a famine of listeners, a famine of hearers, a famine of those who are willing and ready to hear the word of God with the ear of faith. And so we are living in that day. When people come to church and they hear your word, 
But they go away and they do not practice your word. They don't do the word. There's no action on the word. And I pray, Father, that you'd make this a congregation of people who not only hear the word but do it. Of people who act upon your word. And they implement your instructions and your commandments. And they're seeking to be obedient to them every day. We ask your blessing on us. We need a, a revival among our churches. And I pray, Father, that Canaan would be a lighthouse, that uh, people would be drawn here, uh, not because of music or any other programs that might be offered, but they would actually be drawn here because of the preaching and the teaching of your word, where your word is rightly divided and has your blessing upon it. So we ask, Lord, for you to bless us and bind us together as one and help us in the days to come. We think the time is very short before Jesus returns, perhaps even tonight. And we would say with John, even so, come Lord Jesus, even so, quickly come. Now, Father, if we're still here on Sunday, we pray that we'll have a great time of worship together. We pray that you prepare us for your word and that we would come into this place in the Spirit, walking in the anointing of the Spirit. Sins confessed, and forgiven ere we ever come through these doors, that we'll occupy these seats and we'll be able to stand and sing our songs of praise with enthusiasm and with genuineness, and that we'll receive your word with thanksgiving, and that we'll offer our gifts to you with cheerful hearts and spirits. Father, that's the kind of people you're looking forward to. We pray for the day when you hold preeminence over every other thing in our lives. That will not make us weird or strange. We'll be an anomaly because we'll be few, but it will make us totally normal as your children. And we become a joy to all of those around us, a light unto those who are in darkness, and hope for those who have no hope. We pray, Father, that you would grant us that anointing of your Holy Spirit. And we will, as always, seek to give you all of the praise and of the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to have our time of